All right. It looks like we are live, and uh, I will also assume that we are uh, recording this for uh, all of posterity. So happy 20th anniversary to the Santa Rita Hills, the area uh, we all know and love. Today, very oddly, I was asked to do a little uh, video shoot in front of Clopepe, and it was a very emotional moment for me, seeing that vineyard, seeing the the, uh, the vines growing, um, seeing the new neighbors, and seeing all of the proliferation of this area into so many vineyards. Uh, when I first came uh, to the Santa Rita Hills as uh, sort of uh, a disgruntled uh, uh, English teacher, um, there were eight vineyards in the Santa Rita Hills when we planted Clopepe, and that was in 1996. So today we're going to be talking about sort of the historic vineyards of the Santa Rita Hills, I'm going to be sort of uh, moderating and going back and forth with our with our guests, Brian Babcock, Norm Yost, Richard Sanford. And I thought the best way to start to, uh, this morning or this afternoon's, this evening, really, uh, our uh, broadcast is to uh, invite each one of our uh, participants to tell us a little bit about themselves. And what I would love uh, for you to do is try to remember the first time you ever came to the Santa Rita Hills. What did you see? What did you think about this place? The first time you saw it, and let's uh, let's start with Norm. Norm, I know you are a traveling global winemaker. Um, <laughs> what did tell us a little bit about your journey and tell us kind of? Well, I I, I have to say the the first time I came to the Santa Rita Hills was in 1998, and I was being interviewed for the job at Foley okay. Estates, and I was taken up to the top of the hill at the Foley property on 246, and it was uh it was like early August. And it was one of those gorgeous days where there was probably about 75 degrees. You could see the fog sitting out on the coastline ready to roll in. And it was just a nice cool breeze pulling through the valley. And uh, I was told that look down below that all well, it was, they were going to plant about 200 acres of Pinot Noir and Chardonnay to this property. And I was just like, wow, what, what, a, what a phenomenal place. I could, you could see all the way from to the coast. I could actually see a slick six and I could see a, a, a rocket out there. And then you could look all the way to the, you know, the east and see the, you know, the built in corridor. And I was I was amazed. You know, I, I having worked in Oregon, you know, in the Willamette Valley and the Russian River Valley and, and in uh, Napa, it was it was truly unique. And, you know, the first thing that struck me is like, wait a second. This is in a north south valley. This is east west. I was all thrown off. I was like, wait, where am I? You know. This is this is throwing me for for a loop. So I think you know that was that was very impressive for me to be standing on this beautiful hill and being offered an opportunity to work at the Foley Estates property and see this vineyard be put in and the, the location and the topography and it just it was you know I can still vividly picture that to this day and I, I I hold that picture fondly to myself because I think it it is a special place and to me that kind of is the essence of it. I do remember when Billy Hames, who's a local legend uh, on his D8 cat, he was uh, the dirt mover for most of us in our vineyards. Um, wonderful gentleman that he did. He was ripping that hill at Rancho Santa Rosa, which became the vineyards of Foley. And it was coming up with head sized chunks of calcareous shale and diatomaceous earth. Um, so much so that I went home, got my camera, and I still use those photographs of that dark, rich soil, which is pretty rare. In Santa Rita Hills to see any type of dark, dark soil. There was some clay and there was some other material there. But I remember very, very fondly that I thought that property was going to end up making some incredibly beautiful wine, which of course it does when I saw that uh, originally ripping. But um, had you heard anything about this region in the Santa Rita Hills up in Not, real wine country, Napa Sonoma? No, no, to be honest, no, I did. I mean, I heard of Santa Maria Valley. But when I I was brought brought to the site, I was I had no idea. You know, it was and actually it was still called Sandy Inez Valley. Really, I was told yeah. we're going to go visit vineyards in Sandy Inez Valley, and so that was to me was really interesting. But no, at the time, Santa Rita Hills was not uh, anything I'd ever heard of. So to me, it was just like a whole. It was to me, I felt like a kid in a candy store. Like this is a whole new region, and you know, there's like be new wines coming out of here, and they're like these new winemakers are coming in, and it was it was exciting to like, hey, this is kind of be kind of Part of a groundswell of something that could be quite exciting, quite new. I always said, without the Santa Rita Hills, I might have been a small fish up in Napa, cellar rat. Um, I don't think I would have had the the uh, ability to 
do what I've done here anywhere else. So thank you, Santa Rita Hills, and happy 20th anniversary. And thanks for the story, Norm. Uh, let's go down to Brian. Brian, obviously, your family has been here um, since the 70s. Late right? 70s yes, yes. So yeah, the barely, but. Um, tell us a little bit about uh, making the transition from Occidental College. I say that because my whole family went there. Long Beach, California, because I grew up there, as did three of my generations of my family. Take us through a little bit of college and then uh, uh, the uh, uh, purchase of the property in the Santa Rita Hills right next to, really, the Santa Rita School. Property was purchased uh, circa 1978. And my first time driving into what is now the Santa Rita Hills was probably early on in 1979 when I started driving the tractor and helping my dad, who with my mom had planted a small vineyard, about 15 acres. Mm. And uh, the one thing that I re remember more than anything, yeah, I, I was in school at the time. I was at Occidental College. I was in a, uh, this, this wonderful fraternity. I had lots of buddies, and, and we were having – raising cane and have more having more fun than human beings should be allowed to have. And so I came from that very rambunctious environment and drove into the Santa Rita Hills for the first time. And I just kind of remember leaving uh, Buellton thinking this, we, this thing's in the middle of nowhere. It was, <laughs> it was sleepy back then. It was quiet. You know, the highway 246 did not have much traffic. You know, I'd stand at the driveway and there just wouldn't be any cars coming either direction for, you know, what seemed like an eternity. And of course, now things have changed. There's been a little bit more development and we've, we've been really fortunate to see all that development just right before our very eyes in the last 30 some years. Um, once I uh, started farming with my dad, got more and more into to the, to the wine grapes that were gonna produce the wines we were making. At the time, it was more the, the fruit salad strategy of planting a vineyard. It was Riesling, it was Gewürztraminer, it was Chenin Blanc, Sauvignon Blanc, and some Chardonnay, not enough Chardonnay, actually, for the upcoming Chardonnay boom. Uh, but no, we didn't plant any Pinot Noir on day one because we were <laughs> we were told it's too cold out there. Ah, <laughs> red grapes won't, they won't ripen out there. So, you know, we were just kind of going with the common logic. And But we started uh, just throwing, throwing stuff against the wall to see what would stick in 1984. So I went to, out after Occidental, um, I migrated up to the University of California, Davis, where I started some graduate work in food science. So fortunately from Oxy, I had a, a, a major in biology and a minor in chemistry. So I was pretty well set to start studying, studying food science. I took coursework for two years. I got there and I realized because my, my master's was gonna be on the food science side that they weren't going to offer me any courses in viticulture or farming. I got there. I go, well, what about the farming? And they said, well, Mr. Babcock, uh, that's horticulture. That's, that's a whole nother master's degree. You know, you, and I'm thinking like, I'm going to be here forever. And so I just started sneaking into all the viticulture classes. I could get my hands on just kind of sneaking in, put my tape recorder up at the podium with everybody else's just pretending that I belong there. And all I did was just immerse myself in coursework for two years. And then in 1984, I was supposed to go back my third year, go back to Davis and do some kind of research project uh, to complete my master's degree. And that year our Gewürztraminer came in very early. It was a little warmer and the Gewürztraminer started coming in that third week of August. I was three weeks away from supposedly going back to school. And my dad who had purchased a small crusher and a small press and some barrels, we started crushing grapes together and I forgot about school. <laughs> was that the, was that the little Buker press that I used to clean? Yes. Which oh we man! Clean. What a great piece of equipment! I'll tell you, it's still it's yeah. still kicking. Makes great wine. I remember I remember running twenty tons of Sauvignon Blanc one night until like midnight, and someone I think your mom went and got us Kentucky Fried Chicken, and we drank Gaia Barolo, yeah. <laughs> and that was my first Gaia. So so thank you. That was got to start somewhere. <laughs> so, uh, when did you plant Pinot? Right around 1987, the first few rows started to, to go in. And then uh, Jim Clendenin, uh, rest his soul, uh, came out with that. Mac, and they started looking at some of the Pinot just on the vine and just like holding the berries in their hands. And, and 
you know, looking at me like this, this could be special. The skins are a little tougher. There's more phenolics here. And, and, oh, by the way, do you know what's going on over at Sanford and Benedict? Have you tasted any of those wines? It's not looking like a fluke anymore. Um, and yes, you need to plant Pinot Noir, you know, immediately. And so with, with that, we, we put in the first five acres and then we put in another five acres at our peak. I think I was farming about 25 acres of, of Pinot Noir. And then the whole thing just exploded. I was the only I was the only commercial vineyard winery on Highway 246 for about four or five years, mm. and of course now we've got 30 or 30 plus vineyards on the Highway 246 side of the Appalachian, and there's another 30 plus vineyards on the Santa Rosa Road side, and and what we've seen is the growth of what is now one of the greatest uh, institutions, ABAs, at least in the United States, and at least in the way of uh, Pinot Noir and Chardonnay. It's it's like the real deal. No, there's, there's no doubt about it. It's going to be fun talking a little bit about these early vineyards as we move forward. Uh, Richard Sanford, um, our David Lett, our, our glorious leader, our, <laughs> I, I really appreciate you being here with us. I always learn uh, so much about uh, my backyard uh, when you speak of the geology and the history of this region. So thank you, Richard, for being here. Um, why don't you tell us a little bit, uh, Bruce McGuire, how are you? Hey, Bruce. <laughs> I'm here. That's fantastic. That's the best thing I've heard all day. Um, we'll be with you and Bruce in about uh, a couple minutes after we talk to Richard. We're just doing little introductions. Richard, why don't you tell us a little bit about the first time you first saw the Santa Rita Hills, how you felt both visually, spiritually about this region and why you had, why you had great faith that this could lead to a conversation, you know, 35, 40 years later uh, here uh, on the internet. Yeah. Uh, well, thank you, uh, Wes. You know, uh, preceding all of this, and you had just mentioned, Jim, but I'd just like to formally uh, raise my glass with you guys in recognition of our uh, fallen cam com comrade, Jim. Uh, we regret his passing and uh, regrets to his family as well. Absolutely. So, Indeed. Really important person to us. And as I was reflecting on our time together, you know, all we have are the memories. I've got 50 years of memories with Jim, and that's a, a long time and, and a life well lived. So, um, cheers, cheers. 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 I'm getting you know, an old Burgundy. He might be a little disappointed. Uh, you know what? He's having a great time in heaven and sharing some of his older vintages and catching up with some of our old friends. So, um, True that. You know, uh, there was no great business here when I came. There wasn't any enthusiasm. There was uh, mission grapes were growing uh, in the last century. And uh, pre-prohibition, there were a few small vineyards. But I always find it ironic that Lompoc was settled as a temperance colony. <laughs> <laughs> I came along and wanted to grow grapes here, of all things. But grapes were really unheard of. And in 1964, uh, two gentlemen from the Central Valley came, uh, Dee Mattei and Nielsen, who were grape growers from Delano. And they planted some experimental grapevines in the Tepesque Mesa. And at that time, I had just returned from um, a war and uh, the Vietnam War. And uh, my way of getting into wine was really uh, through some pretty deep introspection and uh, recognizing that I had to connect with nature. And so really it was to try and create a job and uh, try to create a job in nature. And I'm so grateful uh, to have found something that resonated so well with me. But, uh, you know, uh, Wes, you said early on that uh, about the connection with the vineyard and the tears in your eyes at the opening to your, your estate that uh, you no longer have grapes from. And I want to recognize that each vineyard has its own expression, um, its own personality. And the great vines within that vineyard express so beautifully the space and 
that's so wonderful about wine and our particular space because we've got all these beautiful variable climates that uh, I recognize. I had studied geography at UC Berkeley and after uh, geography here at uh, UCSB. And uh, I had recognized the unusual characteristics of the, the transverse valleys of the, of the Santa Barbara County. And Santa Rita Hills as an appellation was not recognized at that time, but I recognized the transverse valleys and began prospecting within the area for a potential place to grow grapes. And I recognized it was about a degree a mile as you traveled east or west in the valley. And uh, finally, uh, it seemed that this area fairly parallel with the coastline uh, was appropriate. And this was these transverse mountain valleys were from San Luis Obispo to the San Ynez Valley. So it, it uh, allows for the westerly winds drawing off the ocean to come into our valleys and moderate the climate. And it's such a unique place because uh, I call it refrigerated sunshine that we've got <laughs> this corner of California jutting into the Pacific and cooled on two sides, overlapped with fog to protect the intensity. So. We've got this remarkable climate in the world, really. It's the only east-west running mountain range in North America. There's one in Arkansas that's small, but we have <laughs> the biggest one uh, and allows for this unique climate. So it was uh, driving along the road and finding this place at the same time as I was thinking and reflecting on this, it was a coalescence of events for me that I had returned from Vietnam. I was discouraged by having been sent there. And uh, it was a little something counterculture, I suspect, at the time. And, but luckily, I had uh, been involved in the sailboat racing, and I had a little business bringing boats back from races. And I met gentlemen sailboat racing that were able to introduce me to other gentlemen. And finally, as I became interested in wine and uh, decided to be in the business, I purchased 40,000 cuttings from Muriel Nielsen. And uh, Bruce Greg McGuire, you'll remember, uh, uh, what was his name? Bill, Bill uh, Collins, who planted your vineyards there. Actually, I packed them in my truck at his place and brought them to my house and Santa Barbara and healed them in and sand as I went off on a sailboat race because that was my business at the time. <laughs> so my friends kept the grapevines moist with water as I was traveling and coming back uh, looking for the right piece of land. Uh, ultimately was able to rent some land by a guy named Norm Bacon who owned the shipyard actually the ship Chandlery in Santa Barbara. That now is part of Betty Williams Ranch. Uh, and um, at that time, at Buttonwood, and at that time, um, Norm Bacon owned it and leased us some land to plant uh, a little nursery to grow the cuttings. And uh, I figured that if I buy the cuttings at 10 cents and we could grow them for a year, there would be 90 cents at the end of the growing season and we'll have all this equity. And uh, we could go out and get some guys to invest and then we'd have a vineyard. And uh, so we planted the nursery from those cuttings that then went, went out and knocked on a lot of doors trying to find investors. In the meantime, looking for the right piece of land. And this wonderful spot on Santa Rosa Road uh, was not on the market, but an investor named Bill Kalfas had owned it. And so I marched into his office and suggested we would buy it and plant this vineyard. And he, kind of laughed, but he said, okay. 
So that would be $470,000. And I said, well, I don't have any money, but uh, this is really what I want to do. And so I went out to find these new partners at the Los Angeles Country Club of all places. <laughs> and they North, were, North, the North Course or the South Course? <laughs> this was, these were the members of the wine committee. Ah. And this was the beginning of uh, an interesting period because there were vineyards beginning to be planted as a tax investment. Mm -hmm. And uh, some of these, Bruce will remember that the big partnerships that invested went bankrupt and asked for more, you know, for some reason, oh, the vineyard didn't produce enough grapes and the vines didn't grow fast enough. And Bruce has heard these stories before, but at any rate, Bank of America and Prudential became the vineyard owners of these new mm. partnerships. In the meantime, uh, Pierre's Vineyards and ourselves, we were um, farming them. And finally in 1970, uh, the, plant, the, the vineyard uh, we planted in 1971, and it was uh, Riesling and uh, Cabernet Sauvignon, because those were the great varieties typically yep. growing in that area at the time. Yep. But uh, uh, in the meantime, we, uh, Michael Benedict and I got some uh, uh, rootings from uh, Carl Winty of uh, Two Clones of Pinot Noir. There it is. You have, you know what? I have that also. I'll put it up here so you can see. But that's the original Sanford and Benedict label. I peeled off of a box. I wish I wish this one said Pinot Noir on it. <laughs> yeah, Brene. You know, <laughs> this one of all things says Pinot Noir 1975. Wow. Wow. And huh. uh, this was not a legal wine. Because 1975, we didn't have a bond, but this wine was the wine that we made in a little barrel uh, of the very, very first vintage of the vineyard, and able to uh, uh, see the quality of the of the wine, and that encouraged us to get an additional partner to convert the barn into the winery. It's awesome. And, 19, I, and you're I, 19. I, go ahead. I just want, because uh, you were talking about place, Wes, mm -hmm. and and uh, how special this place was, but there wasn't an appellation at the time. Mm -hmm. But I'd like to read what we came up with on the label because um, uh, we thought a lot about this oh. special place. And this really, as I was thinking about it the other day, says it all. It says, it says uh, excuse me, grown, produced, and bottled at our vineyard in the coastal hills of the San Gianez Valley in Santa Barbara <laughs> County by Sanford and Benedict wine growers at Lompoc. And that's as about as succinct as it can be because we are in these coastal hills of the San Gianez Valley which now, uh, thanks to Wes and uh, Brian uh, and a lot of us working on this, uh, has become its own appellation. We're so proud of it. But um, I'm delighted to be here with these wonderful winemakers. Thanks Thank for having me. I was, I was gifted this bottle from uh, the Miller family, uh, 1980 Sanford and Benedict Cabernet Sauvignon. And the thing that I'm most surprised about. I wrote uh, a long um, sort of treatise on the wine because I found it absolutely fascinating. The question was, can a wine be profound and profane simultaneously? And the answer is yes, because this wine is alive. This wine has character that is worth paying attention to, what, 41 years after being vinted? Yeah. It, I mean, if you love a Bloody Mary, you will love this wine. <laughs> like there, there's, there's a, there's a thread of celery seed and celery, um, uh, salt and so much savoriness that 
Um, but the verve of the wine, by the way, 12.0% alcohol, not only is your back label uh, not too flowery, but no one told you you're supposed to make 15% uh, uh, alcohol Cabernet, which I think would be physically impossible in the Santa Rita Hills. But I just wanted to say that that wine was, was special in that label. And the 1976 Sanford and Benedict Pinot Noir was uh, – was uh, written about by Dan Berger at the LA Times, who called the 76 Pinot Noir from San Francisco Benedict the greatest domestic Pinot Noir he'd ever tasted. Mm, so, wow. And if I you know, even, I didn't even know that, but I want you to see this. 12.5. 12, five. Five. 12 <laughs> no. Just obviously table wine. Yeah, he's got the Pinot. Yeah, 12. That's five. awesome. 12, five on the Pinot. Yeah. That's awesome. Bruce McGuire. Tell us a little bit. We're a uh, little bit about your journey, and uh, we're we're opening up by the story of the first time you drove into the Santa Rita Hills. Well, um, it kind of goes back to the '76 Sanford and Benedict. I was working up in the, um, actually, it was in the Delta, and there was a lot of buzz about the wine. I'd had it a few times. And when Pierre contacted me and kind of mentioned that there, he just planted, he had a vineyard that he planted in um, 72, a mile and a half away from Sanford and Benedict. So that definitely got my interest. And the fact that the, um, the winery was two blocks from the beach in downtown Santa Barbara, also got my interest. <laughs> you were the funk zone before the funk zone was the funk zone. It <laughs> was the funk zone. You lost the funk, you lost the funk Mr. The McGuire. <laughs> yeah, early on in the funk zone, there'd be uh, fish dumpsters going down the street, um, dribbling. So it was funky. Um, anyway, um, I took the position and Basically, going back to finish up my, you know, um, previous job, I stopped at the vineyard, and um, it was definitely magical. It was late in the, the afternoon. Uh, there's an overlook that looks down the, uh, up and down the San Inez River. The fog was coming in. Um, I was like, wow, can't wait to get, to get back. I didn't make the... 1981, I started in November, um, but I had a chance to start working with the vineyard almost immediately wow. uh, when I got down there, including getting um, samples or cuttings from Michael Benedict of Pinot Noir. It was like, you don't have Pinot planted, you have to plant Pinot Noir. And I have been trying to figure out exactly where the cuttings came from. Maybe Richard can fill fill in some of um, like the sourcing. You said uh, Winty was your source, uh, but what was the um, Martin Ray or um, which is what Michael called it? Well, it's a, the Martin Ray clone is really the clone that was planted on Mount Eden. And so it was um, some time, it was actually the clone that Paul Masson brought from the old country and mm. uh, just over a hundred years ago, uh, probably 19 or something. <laughs> it was, it was when Paul Masson was a person before it was a corporation, yeah. right. but uh, it was largely grown on uh, Mount Eden. That's why it's called either the Mount Eden or the Martin Gray clone. And um, uh, the other clone that we planted there was the uh, uh, Napa Gamay, mm. which is- Yeah, really I remember that. Now, yeah. is it true that the Napa, I've, I've heard rumors about this, that the Napa Gamay clone made the best Pinot Noir at, at Sanford and Benedict. Can anyone speak to that? No, I don't think so, Glass. I think that they added, each added its own thing because the, uh, the Napa Gamma was a very upright growing clone. Uh, very, yeah, exactly. And uh, those days we had California sprawl, so we didn't, weren't concerned about vertical shoot placement. And uh, in fact, 
as Bruce would attest, uh, all those early vineyards have this immense spacing uh, where our, our, our vines were 12 feet apart. Yeah. And because yeah. that's the way you grew grapes in California at the time. And uh, particularly in our region with the amount of foliage. But um, to your story, Bruce. Um, so we planted Martin, what we called Martin Ray because that's what Michael Benedict called it. I know you call it Mount Eden. Um, but we had that, that vineyard block in production for close to 40 years before the drought took it out. Mm. And it made really, really spectacular wines. Um, subsequently, we've replanted um, that site with uh, 37, what? which is uh, um, the Mary Edwards selection of Mount Eden. Mm. So I can't wait to see how that turns out. That's incredible. Um, I'm going to I'm going to share my screen and we've got a little bit of a, uh, a presentation uh, to share. And let's see what we've got. Let's see. Window. There we go. And that would be it. I hope you guys can all see that. And um, so if we look at the uh, years, uh, we heard a good little bit about the 135 acres uh, at Sanford and Benedict in 1971. Um, you know, not riding on anyone's coattail the year later, 133 acres uh, at the beautiful La Fond Vineyard. 1978, uh, Babcock with his 89 acres we heard a little bit about. Brian, what were the, uh, what were the varietals first planted in 78? You said Gewurztraminer? Gewurztraminer, Riesling, Chenin Blanc, Sauvignon Blanc, and Chardonnay. Are aromatic whites still some of the best grapes that can be grown in the Santa Rita Hills? Yeah, anything that ripens. I mean, we made phenomenal Riesling and very good Gewurztraminer. And the cool climate, the longer hang time just accentuated those varietal characteristics from those varieties. And those wines were glorious. Um, I did struggle early on with the Sauvignon Blanc as I uh, discovered that you really need to get a lot of direct sunlight on mm. the clusters. Otherwise, the wine can be very green. I mean, a little bit of the grassy thing goes a long way. And uh, as I started to expose the fruit to more sunshine, direct sunshine, um, we started to move into more of a window of, of you know, cherimoya and guava and kiwi mm. and all like really elusive exotic flavors in the Sauvignon Blanc. Ultimately, I struggled getting the Chenin Blanc ripe. Mm. When, when it was ripe, it was amazing. But when, you know, when it wasn't ripe, it was a little shrill, a little stiff. And then, of course, the Chardonnay was great. Just like you know, I mean, there, there's you know, there's this discussion out there now, depending on who you're talking to, this idea that maybe the best grape in the Santa Rita Hills really isn't Pinot; it's Chardonnay. And you I'm, start I'm, in that, I'm in that camp. I'll raise yeah. my hand. You start to taste some of the Chardonnays that are being knocked out. It's like, I mean, the combination of fruit, this California fruit and, and the richness and the ripeness with the minerality and the acidity. I mean, it it's its its own thing. And it from the standpoint of terroir and climate, I mean, it is, it's a glorious thing. And I mean, I think our Chardonnays deserve a place on the table with the world's best wines. And I mean, the Pinot Noirs too, I mean, that whole earthy thread that that just sort of transcends and, and and wafts its way through wine after wine after wine with that signature of earth in the Santa Rita Hills. I mean, it's, you know, that kind of pulls you back to this, well, maybe Chardonnay is Chardonnay the best grape. I mean, these Pinot Noirs are pretty smoking hot too. So, I mean, I think that, you know, it, it's, I guess the exciting thing is that even after all this development, we're still in our infancy. Yes. And it's like, you want to find out what, what's the best grape here? You know, talk to me in a hundred years, really. I mean, <laughs> you know, yeah, well, not, not only that, but I mean, uh, in night in the early 1990s, Dr. Richard Smart published sunlight into wine and revolutionized canopy management and really brought the vertical shoot position trellis, which would allow sunlight to move through the canopy sunlight, wind, removing vegetal and herbaceous components and, uh, in, you know, sort of encouraging terpene production, which means a whole new thing in the Santa Rita Hills these days, but we'll stay on grapes. Um, Brian, I know you are incredibly passionate about canopy management and looking at new ways 
uh, to a certain extent, maybe you are our Richard Smart in Santa Barbara County. How do you think canopy management and the integration of vertical shoot position trellising right as the larger groups of people were moving into the Santa Rita Hills to grow grapes, would we have been the Santa Rita Hills without these new trellising technologies? I mean, of course we would have, but eventually, do you, what do you think? You know, eventually I think so. Yeah. But you know, the whole vertical shoot positioning, which is, you know, it's the system where you start off the, like, you know, the French sort of start maybe 12 inches from the ground and then they force the shoots up into the trellis and it gives the vineyard that, that looked like row after row after row of hedges. Right. And Burgundy looks like that. Bordeaux looks like that. A lot of the fine wine growing in Europe looks like that. In California, typically we have a drip line, a wire and a drip hose and a drip line beneath all that. So we tend to like to start 24, anywhere from 24 to 36 inches, two to three feet off the ground, but we still drive our shoots up into the trellis and that's vertical shoot positioning. And that really was a system that addressed the sloppiness of what Richard was identifying as the California sprawl, which is just run the production on a wire a couple of feet off the ground and just let the vine grow. Well, that created all kinds of problems because your canopy is out of control and it led to a lot of mildew. It led to a lot of bunch rot. It led to a lot of shade, too much shade, and it led to a lot of poor winemaking. So, but it was a way to try to get the sprawl out of under control when we went into vertical shoot positioning. We kind of looked at, you know, Europe and said, well, how do they do it? And so that's when we started to do this sort of hedgerow like farming. Yeah. Now my, my system at this point moves the so-called platform where the vines start to grow up to eye level. And then I'm letting Vitus so more or less be Vitus, letting the vine grow naturally and really trying to radicalize this idea of bringing gravity and wind, wind direction and sun and sun position vis-a-vis -vis time of the growing season so that these things can work with you sort of like, you know, natural orthodont natural or orthodontia, if you will, on the vine to help Vitus get to where you want it to be, to open up a number of possibilities with your canopy management to invite greater or lesser degrees of sunshine to penetrate into the canopy or, or create 100% shade or open it up completely. Mm -hmm. And now that I move things up off the ground higher and let them grow more naturally, it's it's been really cathartic. It's been That's awesome. Cool. And I, I've, seen cool. this, I've seen the system and it, it just looks like it's also you know, in a time where it's a little bit more difficult to find uh, employees and labor, it seems to be. And if, if the people out there are listening to uh, California Sprawl and, and VSP, let me give you a, a, a 10 second lesson. Uh, California Sprawl is like dreadlocks and a VSP is like a, <laughs> it's like a mohawk. Yeah. Yeah. So it's, it's, it's whether or not you're and how you're putting that all out there. In 1980, the Sweeney Vineyard was planted by the Marks family. Um, friends of mine and also um, compatriots from the University of Redlands. Um, we had Chris Marks and Christy uh, coming in, helping out uh, Bob and Donna, who purchased the property in 1978 and planted it in 1980. Um, the thing that I remember most about uh, Sweeney is was they were insane to dry farm it. And when the dry farming worked, that was the most intense Chardonnay I've ever tasted. Montrachet be damned. Boy, that Sweeney Canyon Chardonnay would um, would would put fur on you. It was so beautiful, <laughs> and um, they also grafted a little bit of that Chardonnay over to Pinot Noir. Um, I always considered it a Chardonnay uh, property. Does Does anyone on the panel have uh, any memories of Sweeney or anything you'd like like to share? I made some of the first wines, and I would. Uh, agree with you that um, the intensity of the Chardonnay coming out of there was remarkable. And the dry farming, the compact canopy, a little bit of stress, vine level um, really did lead to a lot of that, that uh, very exotic, very, very just crazy intensity. Um, but it's that core, it's that intensity that really I'm, I see in a lot of Santa Rita Hill Chardonnays today. You know, so it wasn't, was it the dry farming? Was it the location? Or was it something that, that is now being achieved in a number of locations throughout the Santa Rita Hills? You start to take a step back and it's like, well, maybe the Santa Rita Hills is just a great place for Chardonnay. You All know, right. and if you need to irrigate, you irrigate. And if you don't, you don't. But um, it's what's what's coming out of this place now is just insane. I'd, I'd uh, like 
uh, charm in uh, Wes and tell you that uh, Chardonnay is really what put Santa Barbara County on the map originally. <clears throat> that, uh, as I was mentioning before, some of those partnerships that Bruce and I remember went back to, uh, they went bankrupt and they were owned by the, by the funding agencies. The, the Nat, Napa Valley wineries were coming and buying their production and they wanted them to own it and provide the grapes, but they were putting our Chardonnay into their wines, but not telling anybody. Upgrade <laughs> quality. Santa Barbara okay. County making Napa Chardonnay better since 1971. It's so true. And they didn't tell anybody until, I think uh, Bruce, remind me, it was probably 1983 or 85 that all these guys came and bought the available vineyards. It was Mondavi. Yeah, I think 85, 86. 86. Uh, they bought all the vineyards from the from the, the life insurance funding companies, taking the vineyard, taking the wines out of our ability. And uh, yeah, you couldn't buying, get. You couldn't buy grapes. You, you couldn't buy grapes. Because I always they're all purchased by Napa people. So we I had always thought. Vineyards. I always thought Santa Rita Hills took 10 years longer to get popular because we were drinking all the wines ourselves while the production, the production had to reach a critical mass where the wines would get out into the world. And I think that happened maybe in the late nineties. Um, and of course, you know, 2001 having our own Appalachian, I think mattered a lot. Uh, we still have uh, El Habali, which I would love Richard. Um, what would you like to tell us about the El Habali uh, vineyard? Oh, it's a very special place. The Habali vineyard is uh, a little vineyard that Tekla and I planted. Uh, I've been so lucky to have been uh, able to plant a number of different vineyards on different sites. And that's why I mentioned, Wes, that personality. That it, it does have its own personality. <clears throat> I left Sanford and Benedict uh, to start Sanford Winery in 1981 and then uh, uh, planted a vineyard at Al Habali Ranch, uh, which Tekla and I, uh, where we live and created Sanford Winery. And um, uh, the cuttings were actually from the Sanford and Benedict vineyard. So uh, that was the Mount Eden clone. And then we also had a clone 72 of, of Chardonnay. But uh, I, it makes wines of great elegance, I think. And I'm so proud that uh, both at uh, El Habali and then ultimately we got the Sanford and Benedict Vineyard back for the Sanford winery production in 1991. And we're able to have uh, all that vineyard land um certified organic for the next 25 years so That's fantastic we're very proud of the vineyards that we planted alongside sanford and benedict the rinconata ranch of 100 acres and also the the encantada which uh, mm. is mostly all pinot noir but it's been a wonderful assemblage of vineyards to have been involved with over the time and i've so enjoyed sharing the grapes with these um, all of you younger winemakers everybody's younger <laughs> now right bruce <laughs> that uh, it's been so great to see everybody craft these beautiful wines and thinking about jim clinton and i remember and brian you will remember uh something we called the signature series yeah and uh, i remember when i came when i got the vineyard back after 10 years of, uh, of making uh, wine under the Sanford label. Many people had enjoyed the grapes over that period of time. And I was rather jealous about having all the grapes for my own use after getting the vineyard back. And, I, and, and everybody said, well, you're a spoiled sport. And I was, and because uh, they were mine, I felt. <laughs> Monopole. But finally, I suggested, why don't we all 
uh, make wine from these beautiful grapes. And we had a group. It was Brian, uh, Jim Clendenin, uh, Bruno Del Fonso, who was making wine for Sanford at the time and is a very talented guy, Lane Tanner, Rick Longoria. Mm. Um, it was a really special group of people. And I, I, I uh, the, 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 the importance to me was that we would create wines and uh, we would get each person would have three tons or a ton. How many was it, Brian? Three tons of grapes make like three tons. and give us back a barrel each that yeah. we, Bruno would then uh, ultimately brand blend. So we, uh, and the only caveat was that every quarter we would get together, sit around, talk about our wines and, uh, you know, tell each other what we thought about it. No press, <laughs> no outside communication. Yeah. And you know what, Brian, I think it made better winemakers out of all of us. Mm. Oh, yeah. Your face, I remember that terrible SO2 problem you had and yep. somebody else said, um, what did Bruno call uh, Rick Longoria's? Uh, Ricky Lowbricks. You know, like, oh, yeah. Like, not, like, not, not ripe enough. Not ripe enough. But <laughs> we were able to chide each other and to encourage each other along the way. And then I bottled the um, the nine barrel or the barrels that, six barrels that Bruno had, we bottled and called it the signature. And I should show you a label, Wes, because it has the signature. I, I remember these were wines I saw when I was coming into the valley. Each of the winemakers on the label. And so it's a testament uh, to the vineyard. But it was a really fun project for a couple of vintages. and But then it became so challenging, as you know, winemakers. Uh, Cats. These were, yeah, it was challenging, but it was fun. And Thank you. Richard, that, Richard, that wouldn't happen. Before. Wouldn't have happened unless we had such a great ambassador, you, uh, who oh. kept us all from from killing each other uh, <laughs> in, that little, in that little room. Brian, uh, Brian, did Lane Tanner was Lane Tanner involved in that? Yeah, yeah, yeah that's uh, what I remember too. That's the, that's, I think that was number that was number six. You know. Norm Yost, I have. Uh, you uh you have a you have a uh, connection to uh, Norm and Troutel Huber, my neighbors for 20 years. Um, I had some of the best like schnitzel and spetzel over at their house, but that's <laughs> neither here nor there. Um, the Hubers, if I'm correct, they have grape growing in their family back. You ready for this? It's hard to imagine as a as a Californian to the 16th century. Wow. What huh. can you tell us? What can you tell us about Norman Troutel and that beautiful Huber Vineyard, and perhaps some of the best Chardonnay in the world? Well, the, the history of the Huber, I, as I know it, is that uh, Norman Troutel came to Santa Rita Hills. Thank you, Brian, to your father. I believe he uh, introduced him to Santa Rita Hills. Long and, and Norm actually decided to plant apples. I think he was going to take over the uh, the apple crop and uh, felt like he was going to be very successful at that. And I actually understand that there was an apple stand outside and Norman Trottle would uh, man the apple stand on weekends and sell apples. And uh, as, as time went on, Norm realized that that was not going to be successful. And then Brian, once again, your father, I think, encouraged Norm to put grapes in. And he, he planted some Chardonnay, uh, I believe, in 86. And then he established the winery in 87. And I know he sold grapes. Uh, I talked to Rick Longoria. Rick, Rick worked with some of the, the early fruit, and he said he spoke highly of it. And uh, and I believe somewhere along the line, probably in the uh, early 90s, uh, he planted Pinot Noir and then the infamous Dornfelder grape. Uh, the field of thorns. That, the, <laughs> the grape that can ruin a fermenter. I used to call it squid ink when I worked with it. It was it was the darkest grape I've ever worked with in my life. It was, uh, and it was Dornfelder is a, a a grape that was developed in Germany. It was a, a blend of two uh, a genetic blend of two grapes that Norm had a friend brought over some cuttings and he actually started. Uh, I think he had the largest planting of Dornfelder on the west coast of the United States and probably to this day still does. Um, and to me that, so that was, so that was the three varietals that he produced off the property. 
And at the time, and at, I think the final planting was about 24 acres total or 23 acres total. I think about 10 acres of Chard and 10 acres of Pinot and two or three acres of uh, the Dornfelder grape. Yeah, um, yeah. I started working with his fruit. I met Norm in 2004 in a very Norm way, as we all love Norm. He was a, he had a stuck fermentation and he was at Presidio Winery and he's like, I need help. And that was kind of <laughs> my introduction to Norm. So, oh, Norm, you've got a stuck fermentation here. I, I think we, we, we need to take care of this. And so that, that was the beginning of my relationship with Norm and Trottle. And I, they're wonderful people. And I, I really enjoyed working with the wines. And I think the site is, is very interesting. It's right off a of Hapgood Road. Uh, it's got its challenges. That big row of eucalyptus trees was always um, always a challenge because those wonderful uh, oils off the eucalyptus somehow always would kind of sneak over. And obviously, eucalyptus trees, as we all know, the, uh, the winds in the Santa Rita Hills blow from west to east. So we always had uh, difficulties getting preventing that from encroaching. And then uh, Norm was also very particular about his farming, and so we always had, uh, you know, the challenges of getting his fruit ripe. But when it, it when it was on, it was spot on, and I, you know, I truly believe, as we were talking about Chardonnay, it was some of the Chardonnay out of there was just, you know, the piercing acidity and the focus and the minerality was just, you know, uh, it was mind boggling. In fact, I remember, I think, in two thousand and five or six, we actually made a stainless Chardonnay, and that was, I, I was like, wow, this is this is really fun fruit and very, very, you know, very focused and very, you know, bright flavors. I want to say that the Ganey Reserve Chardonnay that uh, ended up getting some crazy award like Chardonnay of the world. Uh, it was not vineyard designated, but it was 100% Huber. And I remember, I, I want to say maybe Rick made that wine. Um, Rick Longoria, I should say. Uh -huh. But, you know, as neighbors, they were fantastic, always inviting us over. My quick and funny story about the Huber Vineyard was when I was working for Brian. This was before we netted our vineyards because of those horrible European starlings that Shakespeare brought to the United States. Long story, but I won't tell it. Look it up. It's true. Um, that basically yeah. Brian would set up his um, his propane cannons to go boom, 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 boom. And all the starlings would fly over to Huber. And then <laughs> Huber would set up his cannons to go boom, 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 boom. And they would fly over 246 back to Babcock and back and forth until Walt would take his black labs out with his shotgun and do some real bird control. But I've been, I promised I wouldn't talk about Babcock's killing birds tonight. So I'll, I'll leave that. <laughs> That's just legal bird control in every European starling that dies. Uh, I am going to share my screen again and we'll see what we can do about bringing up a little bit of one of my favorite slides in the world. And I, I kind of like, I, I would love for uh, Richard, uh, Mr. Sanford, if you want to talk to us a little bit about the last 20 million years, the Juan de Fuca plate, Pacific plate, and the North American plate, please notice that Santa Barbara's terroir starts adjacent to San Diego. Watch what happens over the last 20 million years. 16 million years. 12 million years. 8 million years. 4 million years and drainage and our current ladies and gentlemen if you were made out of rock i would have had to give a trigger warning this is one of the most violent tectonic shifts on a coastline that has ever occurred anywhere in the world um richard as a geology uh graduate what what is this what is this little uh passion play here speak to and why is it absolutely fundamental to what we do here in the Santa Rita Hills? Well, uh, Wes, I didn't see any action in your graphic. Was it on the screen? I keep trying to push play. Is it not showing the play? No, no. Not get it's not getting the action, but it's, uh, uh, we can talk about it. It's, uh, huh. actually what Russ is referring to is a uh, tectonic plate shifting and we have actually broken off uh, from an earlier mountain range on the North American plate and uh, we have become part of the uh, Pacific plate and have been pulled northward and this little chip that we're on has been turned 90 degrees 
So the mountain range, which originally had gone north and south and was connected to North America, has split off and has turned 90 degrees. And that, be that has become the transverse mountains. And so uh, they were originally formed um, as the coastal range was north and south, but now are eastern and west. Uh, uh, West has a, a slick graphic, but unfortunately, the motorization is not working tonight. I apologize. Yeah, that was uh, from Tanya Atwater, uh, PhD from the geology department at UCSB. We can see here, and I remember looking at this map when we were putting it together for the Santa Rita Hills, that uh, Richard in, just absolutely insisted that we include this wonderful sort of Greco-Roman god of wind blowing from the... Uh, uh, from the Pacific Ocean through these beautiful, I like to say the Parisma Hills in the north are our northern boundary. The Santa Rita Hills is like a shark fin that basically basically cuts through the wind in the middle of our ABA. And then the Santa Rosa Hills in the south uh, contain us. So as the wind goes through the Santa Rita Valley, as well as the valley between the Santa Rita Hills and the Santa Rosa Hills on the bottom, Santa Rosa Road, that we have a very profound cooling impact, best shown by the fact that I was at the Clo Pepe Vineyard at two o'clock this afternoon. It was 63 degrees. It was cold. Like I needed a jacket in the shade. In the sun, it was it was okay. And then I went over to Los Olivos and it was 80 degrees and uh, I wanted air conditioning. So it is amazing in, this, in these east-west valleys just uh, how profound that impact is. Uh, we talked a little bit about the Sanford and Benedict Vineyard, the Sanford Barn, um, which I think this photograph doesn't give it as much uh, elevation as it really shows. If you're up at that barn, uh, you can really see all the way down into the river. And it's really an absolutely magical, magical spot. Is um, anybody, are you all getting this, the slideshow? No, not, no. You're, you're, you're. Your video is not working, Wes. Huh. I'm gonna I'm gonna go ahead and stop my share, come back to here, and I will try one one more time to share the screen. You've got great graphics, but they're not can you see yourself looking I, looking swollen? Can you see the you uh first Andrew, I look swollen? No, I mean no, the first press in the Santa Rita Hills. Oh, there we go. There it is, yeah. Got that. Okay. Wow, is, uh, that's pressing grapes. Yes, is that you on the press? Yes. Uh, that was at the Sanford and Benedict Barn, and are we that are we looking at the at the uh, jacuzzis wow. and your press? You <laughs> Those were actually uh, um, uh, fermenters that I made uh, with Gary Gordon, who had the Gordon and Grant Hot Tub Company in Santa Barbara. Oh my God. We got some uh, American white oak and we stickered them in a shop and made them by hand. So they were beautiful fermenters. Uh, it was all tradition of Burgundy. So I would say this is our Clos Vougeot. There you go. Yeah, yep. indeed. Yep. Richard, uh, if that's you in that photograph, man, it looks like it looks like you were ready to play some rugby. <laughs> <laughs> In that photo, you, know, you were kind I, of ripped. I think that everybody recognizes that, uh, you know, it's not it's not pretty winemaking. It's just yeah. a lot of hard work. Yeah. And there's a lot of material to move. Indeed. But I think it's interesting, Wes, also to recognize that rather than being connected with any place in the world, we were on our own out here and had no uh, support. We weren't. We didn't have a traditional group of people that would plant vineyards or people who would provide machinery. Yeah. We had to kind of figure it all out. Yeah. And uh, and Jim was helpful in that sort of uh, communication with uh, Europe. So we were having a lot of communication with uh, Burgundy and uh, decide to use the traditions there, the older traditions, rather than a lot of new stainless steel yes. so most of the winemaking here was coming from passionate people 
who really recognize their traditions and were trying to follow traditional yeah. winemaking. And uh, barrels were used very much, maybe Hansel up in the North Coast, but uh, uh, my friend Dick Graff of Shalom Winery was beginning to import barrels and uh, we had barrel aged uh, Pinot Noir. So it was very, there wasn't a lot of machinery. It was pretty basic. And I think the wines were better for it. Beautiful. We're running out of, a little bit of a time, but uh, Bruce, I'd love for you to talk a little bit about the Lafon Vineyard um, and some of, I don't know if you guys can see some of the slides that I'm putting up of, uh, of, of Lafon, the barn and a, a other thing. Why don't you tell us a little bit about a little bit about uh, the Lafon Vineyard and what it means to you in the Santa Rita Hills. Well, you know, Pierre planted it in 72. So it was, a, he was looking for property. He had been making wine since 1962. And wow. I think one thing um, that was attractive about it was he could afford it. <laughs> uh, the other thing was that the, um, it, he, he definitely recognized it was a lot cooler than Up Valley, but he too did the kind of scatter plant varietals because that's what was popular. And we also planted um, Cabernet, Chenin Blanc, Zinfandel, okay. and Riesling. Um, the Cabernet field now is entirely Pinot Noir. Um, the Riesling died, finally died in the drought. We have another block. The Chenin Blanc block uh, planted in 72 makes great rootstock for Syrah. Mm. <laughs> and we started grafting Syrah in the mid, kind of early, early mid 90s. And that, I believe, was the first Syrah in the Santa Rita Hills. Mm. That block is still producing, and Chenin Blanc is just such a great high vigor rootstock. The trunks, you know, six, eight inches in diameter. Um, it survived the drought, and it is the most overtly cool climate straw that uh, we have. Wow. Um, That's cool. We actually have really improved the vine health, and it's had one of its best crops in a while last year. Um, our Chardonnay field is the Upper Mesa. Uh, for those of you driving by on Santa Rosa Road, that's the, um, the field you really can see. It's a kind of southwest sloping um, block of marine sand. There is a outcropping above it of fossilized clamshells, and it is consistently um, intense, great depth, great acid. Um, it's definitely a standalone uh, vineyard. We, we yes, but no, we we normally don't talk about Syrah in the Santa Rita Hills in. Um, I find that cool climate Syrah is some of the most compelling Syrah in the world. Syrah to me is really a little bit boring, but when it comes out of the Endicito, when it comes out of uh, the Santa Rita Hills, there's just white flowers and uh, olive brine and so many incredibly and beautiful, beautiful uh, flavors. Um, as far as uh, how would you how would you sort of say that Syrah intersects with the Santa Rita Hills and, and where we are today? You know, it was interesting. I was definitely aware of Bob Lindquist, uh, Biennacito Syrah. I think uh, he, he got Syrah planted there before we started grafting. And when you look at a map, Biennacito is basically 10 miles due north. So we we're the same distance from the ocean. Uh, we basically were looking for um, something other than Chenin Blanc. Um, immediately we tripled the price that we were getting for, for bottle by putting Syrah in 
and it definitely gave us another kind of niche wine to complement our Pinot Noir production. Um, it's just white pepper, a lot of times camphor. Mm. Um, in ripe years, it's really kind of uh, brambleberry, great depth. It sometimes is a little um, chancy. We picked one year, if you guys remember, 1999, which was super late. We picked in December, December 10th. Um, what? Eight, if you want to talk about overt cool climate, it was definitely on the edge. Um, but we got it right. It's kind of an interesting year. That's awesome. What I'd love to do is sort of uh, close out our conversation, Brian. Um, your your vineyard was uh, sort of next and considered one of the sort of uh, late sort of uh, representative vineyards that really started us off. What would you like to talk to? Uh, what would you like to share with folks about um, the early plantings in the Santa Rita Hills that we haven't talked so far? And then I'm going to give you guys each about a minute to close out. Well, you know, I think getting back to Richard's point that the whole thing was we were just it's fledgling is the word. You know, it's kind of the wild, wild west. And it was a process of throwing a lot of things against the wall to see what would stick. And once we got on the, the Chardonnay and, and Pinot Noir um, focus, I think everything started to line up nicely. You know, but the early plantings were just throwing the dice. It's like raw, raw learning. You know, it just like, th just take the dart and, you know, throw it. What variety are you going to plant? Um, and and it, so, I mean, it takes, to, I'm, I'm past the point in my life right now where I look at a site, like somebody calls me in to like do some consulting or something and, and they'll show me some hillside um, and they'll look at me and they'll say, what do you think? Will it be good? And I, you know, it's like, well, get out your shovel and dig, and dig the hole, <laughs> right? And plant the vines and talk to me in 10 years. Mm. And you'll have your answer. I mean, you know, now, I mean, now it's a better, it's like if somebody came to me and they were in the heart of the Santa Rita Hills and they said, if hey, I plant Chardonnay, will it turn out good? I'll say, yeah, <laughs> it will, you know. But in the beginning, you know, before you have the knowledge, you don't have the knowledge. And so it was an exciting time because it was so, you know, this is why it was so special, Richard, that we had, the colleagues and the crew that we had early on, you know, we had Peter Kargasaki and we had Norm Huber and we had Bruno Alfonso, we had Rick Longoria, we had Bruce McGuire. I mean, for me, like Bruce was one of my mentors. The thing that I will love Bruce and, and you, Richard and Jim Clinton for is when I got here, your encouragement, just your encouragement was so special. It's like Babcock, you can do this, you know, but it was like, but get out your shovel. It's not going to be easy, but you can do it if you put your heart into it. And then Jim Clendenin told us how great it can be when you really do put your heart into it. You know, I mean, the, the, the Wes, that bottle of, of San Benedict Cabernet Sauvignon, as, as rare as that thing is, Cabernet, that bottle should probably be in the Smithsonian. It should. <laughs> and Richard, the table that we sat at, you brought us all together. To, to, to develop the lines, the boundary lines of the Santa Rita Hills, and then to do the signature project, that table. I mean, Phil, at the, the Santa Barbara County Vintners Association, Phil's like, yes, that I want that table. It should be in the Smithsonian. <laughs> you know, so, but that when somebody like Phil says that, that's how cool it is that we start off and we really don't even know which end is up, but here we are 40 years later, and it's an institution. And 19, yeah, 1975 Sanford and Benedict Pinot Noir. Can you imagine tasting the first bottle of Burgundy ever made? I mean, pre Malawa Dukes, pre, I mean, that's it, right? That's the first bottle of Burgundy. That's, right. I mean, right. um, I remember yeah. buying a bottle at auction for $200 and I'm like, how did I get this bottle for $200? It's, it should be $20,000. Um, Richard, Richard, uh, close us out. What, what else would you like? Um, oh, I have one last question for Brian. Um, you lamented in 1996 when I was your intern, um, seller rat, whatever. Um, you lamented that the world was not ready for $30 
Santa Rita Hills. It was pre-Santa Rita Hills. $30 Babcock Gewurz demeanor grown estate. Is the world ready for a $30 Gewurz? Well, now I guess it would be $50. Is the world ready for aromatic whites from the Santa Rita Hills for 50 bucks? Yeah. Yeah. And I think part of that is, is the U.S., the American consumer has really grown up now with food and wine, the food and wine explosion that's taken place in, you know, every major city across the United States. You know, there's great chefs, there's great restaurants. There's, you know, this, the whole song, the whole new breed of sommeliers is, is, is a good thing. And it's commensurate with America's interest in great food, great wine and a, and a, and a lifestyle that, you know, begs for these things. So yeah, aromatic whites. I mean, you know, I mean, I'm sort of starting to feel this thing that's like this little bit of a, a rumbling with Gruner Veltliner in the Santa Rita Hills. I think you're going to see more Gruner planted because it ripens early. You get it ripe and the wines coming out of the Santa Rita Hills, you know, from like the Spear Vineyard to John Sebastiano, these wines have nerve and they are beautiful, which kind of gets me back to this idea that like we are still in our infancy. Yes. Which makes the whole thing fun and exciting at the same time. <laughs> That's what I always used to say when I in the 90s when I was bringing these wines around, I'd be like, it's sort of like imagine it's a bunch of people making profound wines without multi-generational experience. Wait till our great, great grandkids are making these wines. They're going to freaking crush it. Richard, <laughs> Richard and Bruce, you guys have created a monster. You've created you done? Godzilla on, on roller skates. Right on. Richard, how would you like uh, – what else would you like to share about the uh, early early days in the vineyards? Anything anything that we've missed? Well, um, just a reflection on the whole thing is that um, a number of people have come to me over time and asked about being in the business. And uh, what I have to say is that uh, most of the people who have uh, who I have counseled and they ask how how they can have a place in wine. And I, I always say that there's always a place for quality. Mm. And here, luckily, we've started off with an integrity uh, that is unblemished, that uh, this wine from this place has come from the soul. Mm. It's come from the passion that people have devoted to being here and doing this. And people are passionate about it. I think uh, things have changed a bit that uh, there are people who now see the potential and there are some corporate interests and that sort of thing. But uh, nonetheless, that that happens when there is success. Yes. So I think that people, as you look into this, that um, there are there is passion in wine. And, uh, you know, it's not for everyone. Uh, uh, Eric Asimov reminded me that, uh, you know, as we started out the, the whole coronavirus uh, episode, that uh, we were having a question about how frivolous it all was. Yeah. But in time, he reminded me that, you know, Richard, that um, this is my connection with nature, that mm -hmm. wine through through wine, Eric Asimov connects with nature. And I... And I like to think that the efforts that we make here connects these webs, connect uh, nature to people who aren't able to be here. And I'm so grateful uh, to be in this very, very special place. Thank you. Thank you. And I will put punctuation on that and say, in your attempts to heal, from a very difficult situation in a very difficult place in a very difficult war your attempts to heal have healed all of us and heal every single person that put a glass of santa rita hills wine maybe i'm being a little bit um hyperbolic but i feel moving to the santa rita hills when i did and doing what i did made me a whole person and gave me a sense of connection with nature a connection with wine a connection with grapevines and a connection with the world by creating something that I hope will keep people at table for an extra hour every day with the people they love. So thank you, Richard. No, no pressure, Norm. But uh, go actually, ahead. Follow, I, I, follow I love that. to jump in. Yeah. Um, for me, I think what I see the Santa Rita Hills. I've been started making sparkling wine in 2007 mm -hmm. with uh, clove fruit, 
And to me, that has been a, an experience that was my, I mean, 2005 was the first vintage of sparkling wine from Flying Goat, but 2007 was the first experience with Club Pepe Pinot Noir making sparkling wine. And to me, that speaks about, once again, we've been talking about acidity, we've been talking about focused fruit, we've been talking about flavors, we've been talking about intensity. And I'm finding that in some of our sparkling wines that now, I'm, you know, we're still making, we're making sparkling wine from Rio Vista, we're making it from Ampelos. And, you know, and I'm finding the, the flavors and the intensity are just over the top. So for me, this is like a new chapter that I I find is very exciting. And I, you know, once again, this, maybe this is the new Epernay. Who knows? You know, uh, <laughs> yeah. sparkling you know. wine, sparkling wine. It's a, it's a, it's a resurrection we can all believe in. It's yeah. So for, so I think, you know, th hats off to you, Richard, for, you know, opening our eyes to this place. And, you know, once again, it just, I think you just enable us to look at the grape in an, just another way. And, you know, sparkling wine for me is another way to look at this site. And to me, it's, it's, it's phenomenal. I'm very excited. And, I think there's a, there's a big future there, and I I understand there's a French wine house that actually has purchased some property in the Santa Rita Hills and is probably starting to make sparkling wine there. So that that speaks speaks to what this place uh, holds for the future. I totally agree. I love all the stuff you're doing with goat bubbles, and I've always looked when I drive out to Surf Beach between Lompoc west of Lompoc might be might be the next Epernay or the next Verzenay. Um, so special stuff, Bruce, what would you like to talk to us about a little bit about the beginning of the, of the Santa Rita Hills and, uh, to help us take it home? I think I've been really privileged to work with the same vineyard for 40 years, yeah. um, and see this area evolve from the shotgun approach that was the beginning of it to to get the identity that it has now yeah. and it's been great working with all of you present in the this event and just the the industry um has been so helpful to each other throughout the evolution of the santa rita hills um I'm lucky. i i think i'm lucky yes <laughs> we all I think we all feel that way. Yes. Um, Brian, slightly different question. Um, from where what you've seen in the future to where we're going, what's the future of the Santa Rita Hills? Just you were, um, un you were unprepared for the question. I just decided I've had enough wine. I'm feeling creative. Honestly, at, at this point, you know, I, I feel like the word institution is is appropriate. So I think it's going to be continued refinement. And, and, all, and continued evolution. And for me, I'm starting to really enjoy the little microcosmic explosions that's now starting to take place in all these different nooks and crannies of the county. You know, now we've got Aliso's Canyon coming online. We've got Happy Canyon coming online. So we have some areas that, are, that have taken our lead in so far as creating an appellation that has good boundary lines and has integrity, has viticultural and geographic integrity. And so uh, the future of the Santa Rita Hills, is, I think, is going to be commensurate and consistent with the future of, of Santa Barbara County in general. And, you know, when I asked, when I first, when I was at Davis, right, I made my first wine in my bathtub. In 1983, I, I won't say they were stolen grapes, and I won't say you put them in a truck jumping over a fence. Yeah, but I you heard the story. So, but I was working in a wine shop. Uh, it's called Mansion Cellars in in Davis, and my colleagues at the time in the store would tease me because they knew I was when I graduated, I was going to go back home to Santa Barbara mm. and make wine. And so, the the red wines that were coming out of Santa Barbara and the Central Coast at the time weren't that good. You know, the Cabernet Sauvignon did not have a good track record. And so they would tease me. They'd say things like, you know, Grasshopper, you know, you better you better stick to Riesling. You better stick to Gewürztraminer, those, that kind of thing. Well, I really think the biggest impact in, like, say, the food and wine industry, I was showing around some sommeliers the other day, and I thought, you know, I firmly believe that the biggest impact on your lives over the next 20 years, at least, is going to be the Central Coast. Mm. And so it's, it's, it's the Santa Rita Hills is leading that charge. It's the lead horse at this point. But, you know, I mean, I'm, I'm making Carignan, I'm making Grenache, I'm making Mencia, I'm making Pique I'm making Claret. I'm on a mad crusade to have fun. 
Mm. <laughs> uh, and it's, and it's we leave it. We are on a guys like Richard and Norm and Bruce that really always, you know, they they have given me the inspiration to do that. You, you know, it's a tough business. Farming, farming is a, you know, it's a competitive sport. And, uh, <laughs> you need, you've got to have some fun. You do. So, I will remind well, everybody, even though we've gone a little bit over and we've almost did 90 minutes when I kind of intended to do 60, which means content is king and we've been doing it. Uh, first of all, check out SantaRitaHills.com. Make sure you check out our 20th anniversary celebration. Come uh, get vaccinated. Come together. Let's uh, let's hug it out. Let's get back to uh, a little bit of physical Absolutely. content. Let's get back to table, 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 table. Norm Yost, how can people find you uh, on the internet? At www.flyinggoatsellers.com or at the tasting room in uh, the ghetto behind Home Depot. Sweet. How about Richard Sanford? How can people find out about Alma Rosa? Alma Rosa has a tasting room in Buellton, uh, just off of um, Industrial Way, Please. next to Eats Restaurant. Yeah. And we also are out on Santa Rosa Road. Yeah. Our uh, estate ranch is uh, El Habali. It's about five miles west, four and a half miles west of 101. And so uh, contact us through the tasting room and come for a visit, please. That sounds great. Uh, Bruce, how can people uh, uh, keep up with what's going on at La Fond? Uh, La Fond is uh, Santa Rosa Road. Um, that's our production facility for red wine. Um, and then downtown Santa Barbara Winery, which is the oldest winery in the county. Um, we have a tasting room and production facility, and then we also have a city tasting room for La Fond wines. And, and we will never forget that you brought the funk into the funk zone be, beyond the fish smell. You brought the good funk, the, uh, the Jocko Pastorius funk. Brian Babcock, tell us a little bit about your awesome tasting room and how people can uh, find you on the internet. So my wife, Lisa, has provided us with the most amazing atmosphere in the wine industry. Um, I've literally seen people walk into our tasting room and be brought to tears. Aww. It is 5,000 square feet of pure soul. And with what she's done, it's vintage, it's art, it's music, it's wine, of course. Um, but the fusion of these things is um, is just crazy good. And we got plenty of space. So I would you know encourage anybody to come out and visit taste the wines and just make a day out of it and enjoy. Uh, BabcockWinery.com is our website, uh, Instagram, Babcock Winery, and uh, you can follow us there. And uh, I love you guys. Thank you. And I love all of you guys too. Um, I would say we should have a moment of silence for Jim Clendenin, but he wouldn't have allowed a moment of silence. So I would just like <laughs> to say that wine, that what Jim Clendenin taught me was wine is uh, an investment to keep the people we love at table for an extra hour every day. I'm Wes Hagen. I work for the Miller Family Wine Company. Uh, we've got a tasting room in Los Olivos for Bien Nacido and Jay Wilkes down in Santa Barbara. And that's as far as I'll go from that. Drink Santa Barbara wine. Drink Santa Rita Hills. Celebrate our 20th anniversary. And no, there's nowhere to go but up from here. So thanks to each and every one of you. Thanks for everyone who stayed to, uh, to the very end. Really appreciate it. Hope you had a good time. And I'm looking forward to this being a historical document. Uh, and a thousand years from now, people will look back and say, how could these guys have all been so good? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Cheers, Cheers. Cheers everybody. Cheers. Thank you. Cheers. Thank you for Barbara at Santa, uh, Santa Rita Hills uh, you, for putting it on. Thank, thank you, you, Barbara. And uh, thank you uh, for Sunlight for turning uh, all of these uh, grapes into uh, into wine. And thank you to, um, uh, to Saccharomyces cerevisiae, the most important industrial microbe ever discovered by humanity. <laughs> Cheers, everybody. I love it. Thanks, Wes. Thanks, Wes. Take good care.